Yeah. My first thing is to apologize for coming here incognito in a false beard. Clearly, I'm um, unrecognizable from the photo <laughs> in the program. Um, and it's not that old a photograph, but the beard is transformative, apparently. Um, the thoughts that I plan to share today arise from the book that I've mentioned in the, the program um, which coming out for the anniversary of the Mayflower journey in 2020. The book is telling the story of the underground radical religious movement which led up to that famous journey. And so I crave your insights and interrogations as I continue to work through that story and the issues it erases. The book is, I guess, kind of strung between two iconic events for Protestant self-understanding. So it, it leads up to the, the sailing of the ship. It starts with the burning of 300 people in Queen Mary's attempt to eradicate English Protestantism in the 1550s, which created the first Protestant underground church in England. So you then have the accession of Queen Elizabeth and the re-Protestantization of the Church of England, but in a way which seemed terribly half-hearted to a lot of Protestants. And the greatest outcry was against the fact that all of the ministers were expected to wear these traditional robes of a Catholic priest, or the bloody beast's gear, as they called them. And in response, the Puritan movement emerged, demanding further reformation, the purification of the Church of England from these remnants of Catholicism. Queen Elizabeth launched a counter-offensive against the Puritans, requiring all ministers to declare their acceptance of these robes or to be dismissed from their posts. Fourteen ministers were permanently removed. And it's at that point that you get the reappearance of the underground church because some of the sacked ministers gathered together worshippers who were now refusing to go to their parish churches and they met in their own houses, in woods, in fields, in ships. They were arrested continually and some of them became much more radical in their thinking. Robert Brown in the 1580s came to the shocking conclusion that religion is voluntary and so the state should have nothing to do with enforcing it. A large number of separatists died in prison over the years, and Elizabethan jail was an extremely unhealthy place to be. And eventually, nonconformist worship was made a felony, so that three leaders of the movement were executed and the rest went into exile in the Netherlands. James I became the King of England, began his reign with the most far-reaching campaign yet against Puritans, and that campaign against Puritans was a tremendous boost to the separatist movement because people left the church, joined the English churches in Netherlands, they grew massively to the point where 102 members decided to head off and turn their banishment into a colony in North America. So... That is a painfully quick precy of the story. Um, and perhaps you'll see what I mean about the book being strung between these two iconic events for Protestant self-understanding, the burnings and the journey. Protestants have generally seen their history in general, and the story of the Reformation in particular, as being about freedom of conscience, freedom of understanding, surviving under persecution. They <coughs> persecute us, we assert the rights of the individual. The Catholic Church, so the story goes, tried to extinguish us on Queen Mary's bonfires, but we stood firm. The countries of Europe tried to enforce their religion on us, so among other strategies, we sailed across the Atlantic to live in peace. We are the subjects of persecution and the agents of freedom. That's the story, but in fact, as you might suspect, it's not quite that simple. There is some truth to that self-image, but it also overlooks a lot. 
And to think about that, I want to go back further to one of the most iconic moments for the Reformation. Martin Luther has been setting out what he understands to be the teaching of the Bible as a corrective to the mistaken teachings of the contemporary church. It's called before the Diet of Worms. He's told that his writings have been condemned as heretical by the church and he's urged to recant at the peril of his life. His answer is that his own reading of scripture overrides the teaching of the church. Unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by plain reason, I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot, will not recant anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. Here I stand, I can no other, so help me God. So Protestantism is, above all else it seems to me, <coughs> the principle that a person has a responsibility to listen to their own conscience and the right to follow their own mind, whatever their leaders say. That an individual Christian who reads the Bible has authority over the church. Even though the church condemned Luther, Protestantism says he was right to defy the church because he stood by what he read in the Bible. And it's easy enough to see in that principle strong implications for freedom of religion. Every individual has the right to interpret the Bible for themselves. And in that case, we have the right to come to different conclusions. We shouldn't be forced to change our minds. So Lutherans came to the conclusion that there is no purgatory and the Reformed came to the conclusion that communion wine does not turn into the blood of Christ and the Anabaptists came to the conclusion that only believers should be baptised. Problem is, as Michael alluded to yesterday, that the Protestant leaders did not grant Anabaptist the freedom of religion that they had granted to themselves, but they killed them for their faith. This was done by the Reformed churches, it was done by the Lutherans, it was done by the Church of England. Those who denied the Trinity were also killed, as were my own separatists. So why? Why did this happen if the fundamental point of the Reformation was the right and the responsibility to listen to one's own mind? the authority of the Bible reader over the church, then why did Protestants find it so hard to follow that through to genuinely respecting freedom and diversity of religious belief? What could make them persecutors? And the first thing to say about that is that they didn't want to persecute because they believed they were not persecutors. English Protestants, by Queen Elizabeth's time, had lived through genocide under Mary, and it defined their world. It's a bit like the way that stories of the Second World War told British people in the decades after the war who they were. The stories of the Marian burnings told English Protestants who they were. They had been persecuted because, as the scriptures foretold, the saints are persecuted by the beast. The regime of the Popish Antichrist, they said, had to use violence against us to convert people because it doesn't have the truth or the Bible on its side. Those burnings under Queen Mary were documented for the English in John Fox's Book of Martyrs and in his book the heroes of the story died with miraculous fortitude for the one true faith and he showed his readers that children of light, as he put it, always had been and always would be bloodily attacked by the powers of Satan. The Book of Martyrs was a masterpiece of propaganda, unbelievably popular, hugely influential. There was a copy of it in every church in England, making it the only book besides the Bible and the prayer book available to every English person. And Fox's number one argument against Catholicism was that the Church of Rome couldn't be the church described in the Bible because it had been the scene of such 
quote, killing and slaying, cruelty and tyranny, such burning and spoiling of Christian blood. See, Antichrist persecutes, Christians are persecuted, was the story. Luther himself had ruled out persecution early on in his career. The burning of heretics, he said, is contrary to the will of the Holy Spirit. Heretics must be overcome with the scriptures, not with fire. So you see clearly a powerful impetus in the principles and in the experience of Protestant <coughs> Reformation towards freedom of religion. But there were also forces pulling the movement in the opposite direction. And the main one, I think, the main consideration which overcame this impotence, sorry, this impetus towards freedom in the Reformation was the concept of the state church, this overwhelming assumption that the church is a Christian nation, a whole Christian society. This was the idea which persuaded Protestants that, um, that freedom was not the most important thing. A millennium of experience lay behind this, throughout which time the whole of Western and Central Europe had been united in one Christian faith. Um, so the story went before Protestantism appeared a few years ago. So agreement seemed to most people obviously possible and natural. Religious leaders and thinkers had power over the whole population, power which come the Reformation, they were in no hurry to throw away. And in that setup, religious dissent threatened the whole fabric of society. Everyone knew that the population must be, relate, must be united in one religion, just like today we know that all <coughs> citizens must be subject to the same laws. So, come the accession of Queen Elizabeth and this re-Protestantization of the Church of England, that regime, the Protestant regime, was very keen not to be like Bloody Mary's. Mm -hmm. It defined itself against her violence. But it was a state church, and so it was inescapably committed to uniting the nation in one faith. Puritan ministers, disgusted by those Catholic leftovers in the prayer book, dispensed with the, uh, the vestments, with kneeling for prayer, with the wedding ring, with saints' days, with godparents. They made all these local changes, dropping things that they objected to as being unbiblical. But when they started behaving in this non-conformist way, the Protestant state church couldn't allow it because to let these ministers worship according to their reading of the Bible would have been like <coughs> allowing civil war in your realm. It had to sack them. And it follows that when some of these Puritans left the church and became separatists, starting their own services in private places, the bishops had to arrest them. And the bishops, to be fair, often did this with a really bad conscience. The man who most had to deal with Protestants, uh, with Puritans, in these early years, was called Edmund Grindle. He was a bishop of London. And a decade before he was arresting the separatists, he had had to flee for his life from the Catholic Bishop of London to, ex to escape his bonfires. Now he was back and he was in power and he was profoundly unhappy to find himself having to play the bloody bishop himself, persecuting his fellow Protestants, and not only that, but his fellow exiles who had come back with him, um, and pro persecuting them not in defense of what he considered to be a vital Christian teaching, but in defense of popish paraphernalia. Unfortunately, Bishop Grindle was up against the contradiction at the heart of the Reformation. He hated religious violence as the weapon of the beast, and yet his Protestantism was inescapably attached to the idea of monolithic state church. And if you're committed to uniting the whole nation in one faith, 
there comes a point when that's impossible without coercion. If it's anti-Christian to persecute, but true Christian faith is obligatory, then something has to give. So, the impetus to persecution was irresistible result of the position that the Elizabethan bishops found themselves in. I find it even more revealing to look at the attitude to coercion of the nonconformists who themselves were punished by the state church. <coughs> both the Puritans and the Separatists who left the church. The Puritans, they wanted to be allowed to have services in the style that they believed was right and biblical, but they didn't want their kind of worship to be merely tolerated. They wanted it to be imposed uniformly on the whole nation. The, the term Puritan was accurate, Puritans wanted purity, not diversity in the church. Their agenda was the eradication of Catholicism and Catholic ceremonies. And even when they were being nonconformists and refusing to conform to the state church requirements, they were still bemoaning the lack of uniformity in their church. Um, Thomas Lever, uh, a leading Puritan, complained that the vestments had themselves created diversion, um, dissension and division in the body of Christ because some were wearing them and some weren't, which was not how it should be. No one should be wearing them. So this controversy over vestments that split the church was not a battle between freedom and authoritarianism. It was a battle between two uniformities. And the separatists who left the Church of England over this stuff, even they often had a similar attitude. They were gathering together to worship in private, but this didn't seem to them to be the natural way for a church to be. They thought of themselves as a state church in waiting. And admittedly, they thoroughly condemned the Church of England for persecuting them. And it was one of their proofs that the Church of England must be a false church, that it was persecuting them, just like John Fox had proved the Roman Catholic Church must be a false church because it persecuted. But because the separatists shared this standard Protestant assumption about what a church is, the only alternative they could envisage to them being persecuted was them being in power and eradicating the religion of their enemies. They sent a petition to the Queen in 1571, and on the one hand, it protested the wrongs and cruel handlings that had led to their, their first martyrs dying in jail, the injustice and subtle persecution as they called it, and yet, on the other hand, this petition urged the Queen to, quote, destroy idols, temples and chapels which the papists or infidels have builded to the service of their gods. I mentioned earlier the separatist Robert Brown, who was active ten years later than this petition, and I'll come back to him now because he was someone who moved beyond this position to come up with a different conception of what the church is. Thanks to his illicit experience of underground Christian community, Brown came to think of the church not as this national authority under the control of the crown, or of bishops, or even elders, but as a spiritual <coughs> community answerable to nobody but Christ. Brown believed that true religion is an essentially personal and communal response to God, and therefore voluntary, in which case forcing unwilling people to, into church fails to make those people Christians, it makes the church unchristian. Um, 
he went off with his followers into exile in the Netherlands. Um, and from there he wrote books arguing that um, a whole parish worshipping enforced obedience to the law of the land, as we see all over England, is not a church. He said, the Lord's people is of the willing sort. It is the conscience and not the power of man that will drive them to seek the Lord's kingdom. Brown concluded from this what later generations would call the separation of church and state. He found it quite unacceptable for either the church or the state to compel religion or plant churches by power and to force a submission to ecclesiastical government by laws and penalties. Now, Brown's thinking on religious freedom was controversial to say the least. The leading Presbyterian radical of the time, Thomas Cartwright, said, Mr. Brown hath absurdly erred. Even Brown's co-worker in leading the separatist church, his friend Richard Harrison, or had been his friend up to this point, read his book and called this idea manifold heresy and a pattern of all lewd, frantic disorder. That was Harrison's uh, response to the idea of voluntary Christianity. The, the separatist church split between the followers of Brown and Harrison. Brown took his group from the Netherlands to, to Scotland, didn't get on very well there. They returned disillusioned to England. And in his next book, Brown abandoned the idea of freedom of religion, which he'd got so little support for. He signed a submission to the Archbishop of Canterbury, acknowledging the Church of England to be the Church of God. He promised to attend his parish church, and six years later, he became the vicar of Thorpe A Church in Northamptonshire. So um, not the most illustrious rad radical career. Um, uh, and later generations were very embarrassed by him, but I kind of like him <laughs> in a way. Uh, however, uh, OK, I, I don't mean to uphold um, Brown's thought for uncritical celebration. Let me just say um, the, the Puritan movement as a whole was petty and legalistic in its willingness to fight so hard over questions like clerical clothing. And Brown's separatism actually took that attitude to its extreme. He was willing to split the church over such issues and condemn everyone who didn't come with him because the very concept of secondary issues was an abomination to him. Brown's idea of scripture, and again this was something that he shared with the whole Protestant movement in general was rigidly prescriptive. The Bible gives us this precise blueprint of every area of church life, leaving no room for adaptation or interpretation, which meant that anything not approved of in the Bible, said Brown and the Puritans, such as clerical robes or church wardens or baptism by midwives, and all the rest is an anti-Christian Outrage. You kind of just pick up on something I just said there myself. The uh, about baptism by midwives is something that Puritans violently objected to. The Reformation was not, in many ways, all that advantageous to women, having you know, destroyed the career path of um, monasticism, which was one of the few things open. And then to add insult to that injury, the Puritans wanted to go further and abolish the practice of midwives being allowed to baptise children. Um, they never used the word midwives, they just said baptism by women, no. Um, there were um, a lot of unnamed uh, women doing a lot of the legwork of Puritan protest. And I'm really intrigued by the question of the involvement of women in separatist underground worship meetings. It's frustratingly unclear just how involved they were, and it's something I haven't entirely made up my mind on yet, but I guess there's maybe a kind of double meaning in my, uh, the title that I, the quote that I chose as a title for this paper, um, These Bloody Men. Um, but I digress. Um, Robert Brown's idea of God, um, in, in this he went further than the Puritans, 
his idea of God was, um, was, was lacking in all grace. And that was a Puritan fault in general, but he took it further. Christ, for him, was the lawgiver, ever ready to divorce the, the, the church, um, his bride, for the smallest defiance of his <coughs> rules. Uh, and Brown was passionate about the purity of the church, such a key idea for the Puritans and even more for the separatists, which I, I find an ungenerous, exclusive and possibly fascistic concept. So, yeah, I have issues with uh, Robert Brown. And yet all these problems were related to Brown's uh, revolutionary idea of freedom. It was paradoxically maybe the the flexible and inclusive national church which needed to coerce nonconformity and it was the rigid and exclusive gathered church which made faith voluntary after brown later separatists continued to talk about freedom and the importance of voluntarily choosing to be a Christian and the iniquity of these bloody men in the Church of England who persecuted them. But they also returned to urging the government to destroy false religion. In exile in the Netherlands in 1609 in King James time, there was a breakaway from the separatist church which started the first Baptist church and around 1612, the Baptists, now led by Thomas Helwys, returned from exile to England because they believed it was their duty to witness to their compatriots whatever the cost. And it was the Baptist Helwys who took the separatists' idea of freedom to their logical conclusion. He said that the church, being a gathering of believers, is not a whole nation, it's not a whole society. And so the state has no business trying to coerce people into membership or belief. He said, the king, quote, hath no power over the immortal souls of his subjects to set spiritual laws over them. Let them be heretics, Turks, Jews, or whatsoever. It appertains not to the earthly power to punish them in the least measure. So, Eight years later, 102 separatists sailed to North America and they took with them a vision of the pure church free from the power of the bloody bishops. But they didn't take, it seems to me, a vision of living in peace with non-believers. So maybe these Protestants did not exactly cross the Atlantic to escape a world of religious coercion because they took the principle of coercion with them when they went. I think that it was paradoxically Thomas Helwys the Baptist, who by that time had probably died in jail, <coughs> who did more to escape beyond religious coercion because he found a different way for Christians to be the church. Um, and I'd just like to... Um, close by saying that I found a, a really thought-provoking um, idea that came out of our discussion yesterday, particularly talking to Becca about the idea that reformation and colonialism have sprung from the same impulse. That's an idea that, is, um, that I need to think about a lot in reaching the conclusion of this book. Uh, so any thoughts on the connection between the reform movement and colonial expedition <coughs> would be um, really valuable for me. So thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much. Again, colleagues.